Brendan Lee Mulligan is my favorite DM. Now, don't get me wrong, I love me some Mercer and Eingar and more, but none of them hold the special place in my heart that Brendan does. His sharp wit, his thoughtfulness, his ruthlessness, it all culminates in an endlessly watchable DM. So how does he do what he does? How is he so good? And what can we learn from him? Planned Improv Considering his background, it shouldn't be any surprise that Brendan Lee Mulligan loves to improv in his games, and the way he does it seems completely effortless. But one of the tricks here is his campaigns are so well fleshed out in terms of their world building, in terms of how the characters are tied to the story, and in terms of what major challenges will be faced, that Brennan can very easily play in this world without needing to do much prep between sessions. Unless of course Allie Beardsley rolls one of their miraculous nat 20s. Nat 20! Nat 20. Nat 20! Every season! Nat 20! But the point stands. In Dimension 20, basically everything is fleshed out except for what the characters are going to do. Even all the major battles are planned beforehand, and Brennan has talked about how he uses them as stepping stones. The context of the encounter may change, but Brennan knows the next battle takes place on a ship, and so he can use what he knows about the characters in the world to direct his players the way he needs them to go. Or maybe the players went in a completely different direction. In which case, Brennan can take something that was planned for down the road and swap that with the encounter that was supposed to be next. My point is, while improv is certainly impressive and a very useful tool, it works best when you have a solid foundation to stand on, with well fleshed out worlds and characters and encounters. Improv also lends itself really, really well to comedy, because comedy matters. Humans are funny. We love to laugh and to make each other laugh. It's a basic human need, even in the worst situations. So if everything is dark and dour and nobody cracks jokes or laughs, well that doesn't feel very human. Dimension 20 is a comedy show first and foremost, but that doesn't stop it from having really dark and emotional moments. So in those moments, how do you find room for laughter? I don't mean that you need to always alleviate heavy emotion with humor, but what I am saying is that us as humans, when we are at our lowest, is when we need to laugh the most, literally for our health. There's a reason that gallows humor is a thing. People in high stress jobs make jokes about some really, really messed up stuff a lot. Honestly, it's one of the only ways they can deal with all the stuff that comes their way and come out sane. On top of that, from a storytelling perspective, if you want to make your players cry, make them laugh first. That is when their emotional defenses are at their lowest, and that twist or that knife that you're planning to stick them with is going to hit a lot harder in those moments. I feel like too many people see comedy as vapid or meaningless, when it can be one of the most effective tools as a dungeon master or any kind of storyteller. Laughter can make your world feel very real and human, and the kind of comedy you use can really set the tone for your campaign. Because... Your campaign can be anything you want. Imagine a D&D &D campaign. Odds are you pictured a band of misfits who come together and pick up mercenary contracts where they can. And I don't want to hate on that style of game, it's great, I played in many of them, but it is not the only kind of campaign that you can run. Dimension 20 has done campaigns based on a lot of different things, including uh, Lord of the Rings, uh, John Hughes movies, uh, Game of Thrones, Sherlock Holmes, New York City, and Harry Potter. They even did a sci-fi season set in the world of Starstruck, which, fun fact, was written by Brandon's mom kind of fun. And you can extend this line of thinking past just your campaign and to your party. How do they know each other? Well, they don't just need to be a random band of misfits. They can be a royal family. They can be a group of high schoolers. They can be a bunch of people who work together. You can use your imagination and take inspiration from other media, combine some things, and create something really unique. But keep in mind that not every style of campaign is going to work for Dungeons & Dragons, specifically as like a system. And that's fine, because even one of Dimension 20's best seasons, Misfits & Magic, or Magic & Misfits, I don't remember at the moment, uh, doesn't use D&D, it uses Kids on Brooms, which is based on the system Kids on Bikes. My point is, when you want to run a D&D &D campaign, or a campaign of a different system, don't feel limited to whatever sort of stereotype is placed on that system. You can do anything that you want. There are so many different ways to play D&D. &D. All you gotta do is look around and think creatively. Hi, if you're still here and you're enjoying the video, please, please consider leaving a like and a comment and a subscription below because my dark patron, the algorithm, said he's going to take away my Eldritch Blast if you don't. Please. 
I want a blast. Linear adventures aren't railroading. The internet loves to talk about sandboxes versus railroads. And to be honest, I find the conversation kind of silly because railroading just gets boiled down to having a path to follow. And I think that's dumb. A game is not necessarily a railroad just because you have a direction to move in or a goal to achieve. In fact, I would argue that most games would benefit from direction. Basically, every game that I've seen Brennan Lee Mulligan run has had a specific goal in mind, even if that goal wasn't obvious at the start of the game. That goal can be as simple as stop the big bad evil guy like in Fantasy High, or just simply survive to see the next day like in Starstruck and Crown of Candy. But in all of his campaigns, he is trying to tell a story. And stories have directions or end goals. An endless choice often results in decision paralysis, where your players will just spend half the session just deciding where to go and you won't really get to play. But if you give them a goal or just a direction to move in, you'll get to play a lot sooner, more, and in my experience, have a better time doing it. And I think part of the trick here is you give your players that goal or that direction, but you don't tell them how to get there exactly. Like maybe you need to find this object and it might be located in this area on the map, but you don't tell them where exactly it is, you don't tell them how to get there, you let them make their own choices. It's just very, very important that you don't infringe on player agency. And what I mean by that is you should never invalidate a choice that a player makes when it contradicts something that you expected or wanted out of the game. If your players make a choice you didn't expect, Roll with it and try to make it as valuable as possible. Besides, D&D is a collaborative way to tell a story. And stories have end goals. Stop the big bad evil guy from doing the big bad evil thing. Get the MacGuffin before the bad guy does. Solve the mystery. Protagonists in movies and books always have a goal. And there's a good reason for that, and we can apply that same logic to Dungeons & Dragons. Speaking of goals, they're more useful than just for your campaigns and your adventures. They can improve your encounters by making them more than just monsters in a room. The encounter design in Dimension 20 is some of the best out there. They only have a certain number of season, so they need to pack in as much as they can. And they rarely disappoint. A quick disclaimer, the stuff I learned here that I'm about to talk about should really only apply to big important encounters. You don't want to put this much effort into a random encounter that they're just going to sweep aside and move on. But this can be super, super useful for creating big, memorable, intense encounters. Give your bad guys goals in the encounter. If you want to make an encounter with an enemy that is far too powerful for your party, make sure that defeating the party isn't their primary objective. Maybe they're doing a really important ritual or they're trying to pull off a burglary. Something that isn't defeating the party as their main objective. Look at the stock market fight in Unsleeping City Season 1. Robert Moses was a lich and he was far too powerful for the party to face head on. So he was doing a ritual and he had his minions attacking the party. It made a fun dynamic when the party was just trying to get through the minions to stop the ritual. You can also flip that around and have your party being the ones trying to accomplish the goal while the enemies are harrying and harassing them. An example of that is the final fight of Calamity, no spoilers, but they were trying to complete a ritual and the enemies were trying to stop them. To sum the last two points, giving secondary objectives to either the villains or the heroes can really spice up the encounter. But what about everything that is around the party and the enemies, the environment? Having an environment that forces players to think creatively and strategically can make an encounter that much better. Look at how the bad kids took down the pavement golem in season one of Fantasy High. Or look how Reika used an elf balloon through anti-gravity and chains to get around the battlefield in Escape the Bloodkeep. The goal here is to make an encounter that is interesting and engaging without being too complicated. This gives your players room to play in the encounter, not just walk up to the monster and hit it a bunch of times. They get to think creatively and have epic adventures that they will remember forever. For all these reasons and more, Brennan Lee Mulligan is a fantastic dungeon master, but he's not the only dungeon master you can learn from. I made a video a while ago about what I learned from watching Matthew Mercer, the one and only. If you want to watch that, click the video on your screen. And of course, thank you for watching. Please leave a like, a comment, and subscribe to my channel in favor of the almighty algorithm.